Welcome back. Uh, this is another episode of Ask Eddie and Anne. Anne, I I already have a sneaking suspicion that we're we have special guest stars today. We do have special guest stars today. So uh, my ex is back in Wisconsin visiting a cousin, and he has two cats, Ellie and Tyrion, who are staying in the apartment with me while he is gone. Okay, I was quite startled when I first came online and there was a gigant, the head of a black cat <laughs> was like staring right in the camera when I signed on. And it was like, <laughs> whoa, that was alarming. Yeah, and that was that was Tyrion. Tyrion. Yeah. I, I thought I saw Tyrion moving around in the background behind you, but I'm sure, as usual, uh, there will be surprising guest appearances Oh, there he is. There he is. You can there see him is. stuffing the picture. Of... There you oh, go. No. Oh, yeah. Okay. A lot of action starting out. You, there won't be any tizzy action today because um, I, I just uh, drove a long, long way to get a, a booster shot and a flu vaccine. And Tizzy went with me in the car the whole way. And so she's a little tired out. So she's uh, she's sleeping now. And uh, she'll she'll be fine. She'll be fine. So let's let's just dive in. Oh, I guess, but I guess I have um, you know report on uh, DC. Yeah, many 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 people send you their regards. Uh, oh, thank you from the AFI Silver Theater in Silver Spring, Maryland, where we had the Noir City DC, which is still going on. I think we're on the next to last day, or there might even be more days than that with Foster Hirsch, the great Foster Hirsch uh, taking over the second weekend. But um, it was all good. Everything was great. Very happy to see everyone. Uh, the audiences were just terrific, and it was a lot of fun, and it was good to be back in the swing of things. And uh so all good. Nothing, nothing negative to report whatsoever. Good. I'm glad. I'm glad to hear it. We've been getting some nice people have been nice enough to post photos, which I always love. So we re retweet them on our Twitter account. Yeah, it it was good. And uh yeah, it went over very, very well. The uh, and and it, folks were happy to be back in a movie theater. Yeah. And, and uh, it was it was very uh it was all very gratifying, so I'm happy about that. So shall shall we let's start start the ball? Shall we get rolling here? Yes. And hope that hope that my my new timer is actually I'm old school. I time things by the sun because I have no <laughs> artificial illumination in my room right now. This is all coming from outside, so I'll know when it starts to get dark that it's time to wind up because. You're gonna you're gonna see that light change. I know, and it's it's those days are shortening this time of year. Yeah, I mean, literally, I got to tell you, Anne, as you know, I, I I already called you once and said I'm gonna be late, and I just ran in. I didn't even take my jacket off, and I like just plopped down here and ready to go because you know the it's always set up these days. You know, it's like everything has to be like a TV studio in your house now that's <laughs> thanks thanks to covid so i was ready to ready to roll even though i just walked in the door uh this is uh christy from grants pass uh the question about the posters was interesting and i'd like to hear more about what goes into creating north city each year it sounds like it starts with the theme and then goes from there how do you decide the theme could you give us a little rundown of the ins and outs of bringing north city to life thanks for all you do <laughs> Uh, and thank you, Christy, uh, for coming to Noir City these these last few years. Uh, it, it's always good to see you there. I know I know who this is. Um, it, it, there's no one set thing. I mean, I will say since I think since the last time we did this, Anne, we now have a new poster. We shot the new poster, um, and that will be unveiled at the uh christmas show which will happen i believe the, the uh i still haven't locked that date i think i mentioned this last time 
It's either the 14th or the 21st of December at the Grand Lake Theater in Oakland, California. Uh, and that's, as is tradition, that's when we will reveal uh, both in the theater and on screen the new poster for this year, which uh, actually has been shot. Uh, it, it's not always that we come up with the theme first and then come up with the poster. Sometimes it works the other way around. And, and Bill Selby, who designs all the posters and is the art director, um, we just ask like, what would, what's the environment that we want to use for the poster? If something we haven't done before, uh, we try to keep things like there's a look to the posters that we want to maintain, but we want each one to be separate and distinct. So, um, I'm not sure I want to talk about what this year's theme is. There is certainly a theme. It suddenly came out of the blue after we had already decided on what we were going to shoot for the poster and all that stuff. So yeah, it does. The theme doesn't always drive what we do on the poster. And um, anyway, I mean, that's about it. It'll be, it'll be interesting. Uh, I guess anniversary is kind of the theme this year because it is the 20th anniversary of the festival here in San Francisco. And it, it suddenly occurred to me that I could extend that across the entire festival. So every film will be celebrating an anniversary and it's all the same anniversary. So, <laughs> so you can, so you can kind of figure that out. Yeah. So, th so there, I spoiled it, but I left enough a, a mystery that people can kind of puzzle it out for themselves. So yes, uh, if you're paying attention, you know what that means. Every film celebrates an anniversary and they all celebrate the same anniversary. Stay tuned. Hey, we'll see if people can figure <laughs> yeah. it out. Yeah, that, that's pretty good. So I'm, I'm looking here and I see that the second question is, is a, our standard question for every single episode. Uh, Gord wants to know, uh, do you know yet when it is going to be held? Uh, back to the end of January and into February or back to the cast or the Okay, so, uh, and Gord uh, was already to come down from Vancouver, British Columbia for the last one, but he contracted COVID uh and and everything was kiboshed so i hope you do gord come down oh look at that there's another kitty playing that's around. ellie ellie okay so these two want it heard about the show and they want to get into the action so we're when we when we last checked in with the cat house uh who uh, emily had just come back from the vet yes and how's she doing She's doing fine. Her tests were, you know, it was just her annual stuff and everything, everything was fine. Other than the vet wants me to get her to eat wet food, which she doesn't want to do. So I will be trying oh. various wet foods and see, and I, I put in a fountain for the cats. So I'm hoping to encourage her to drink more water and I'll try and find a wet food that she'll actually eat. Got to keep those fountains clean. And you're going to go, and over time, you'll go through a bunch of different motors because the motors kind of burn out and get a little noisy. Yeah. And I'm going to see you, if people can see. Can you guys see the. Oh, nice scratches. Jesus. Yeah. So I was sitting on the couch and uh, Ellie was sitting next to me and I was petting her. And Charlotte came into the room and she and Ellie have been hissing at each other. So Charlotte decided this was the perfect time to actually attack her. But my hand was in the way. But so, you got in the way. Yeah. So it's just and some stuff on the front, not a single scratch to Ellie. Of course. So I took a photo and sent it to Brendan <laughs> and told him what happened. And he felt terrible. So you were just the in innocent cat stander. The, uh, yeah. yeah. Collateral damage, I believe. That's too bad. Uh, Tizzy never scratches it. Tizzy has never scratched anybody or, or bitten anybody. She Once in a while, she tries to, and she's pretty lame at it. So that's good. Uh, uh, anyway, so Gord uh, wants to know because he's he plans on coming, which is great. 
uh, it will be January 20th to the 29th at the Grand Lake Theater in Oakland, California. We will be announcing all of this very shortly. Uh, we hope to have more than one, uh, you know, sponsoring hotel. Um, I'm I'm very much looking forward to it. So those are the dates. I don't think it. Uh, we're not going to be bumping up against the Super Bowl this year, but I did feel that for the 20th anniversary, it was a good idea to go back to the long form uh, that was traditional at Noir City. I know last last uh, whenever we did it last March or whenever we eventually did it, I can't even remember now, you know, we abbreviated it to three days, but we're going back to the full 10 this time around. So it'll start on Friday, the 20th of uh, January and run all the way through the following Sunday. Not So there'll be two weekends. Uh, it should be great. I'm, I'm very excited about it. Yes, and after that, uh, the next following weekend, I will be going to Sugarland, Texas for my mother's 90th birthday celebration. Oh, very good. Very good. Um, wow. Yeah, I remember that. I remember when my mom turned 90. That was an interesting experience. Anyway, <laughs> okay, uh, moving on. Uh Let's see here. Eddie, are you familiar with one of my favorite obscure noirs, Hugo Haas's The Girl on the Bridge? It is very different from Haas's other films in that he plays a Holocaust survivor who, like Haas himself, lost his family. Certainly an unusual subject for a film of that period. And, and there is no femme fatale. Rather, Beverly Michaels has a sympathetic role as his kind and supportive wife. I hope that this interesting film will someday be shown at noir festivals. And that's from Bill in Chicago. Uh, okay. Uh, actually, Bill, I have not seen The Girl on the Bridge. Uh, it is, I'm trying to think what the other Hugo, ha there's another Hugo Haas film that I have not seen from that era. I can't remember which one it is, um, but I have not seen it. So I look forward to seeing it. And But I can tell you it would probably, uh, somebody needs to do an entire Hugo Haas festival, just all Hugo Haas films. And uh, and include that one in it, because, of course, if there is no femme fatale and it's not really a film noir, then it probably is one of his films that would be less likely to be shown at a noir city festival or on noir alley. Uh, but, you know, for the sake of being complete, if if there was a Hugo Haas um, film festival or something or a film series, that that would be great. Um, anyway, um, I know, have you, have you seen that film? I have chance? not. Yeah. Um, it's good to have movies to look forward to that you haven't seen yet. It is, especially stuff like that. Exactly. Exactly. So, uh, and then here comes another one. Robert says, um, I've been watching the show, which I assume he means this show since the beginning. And I'm here with my first question. Uh, he would love to hear anything you know about Left Witch's crime B noirish light. <laughs> I love how we these labels that get applied. A uh, squad car, especially whether or not Vicky Raff does all of her own singing in it. Been digging it a lot lately, and it sounds like her, but it also sounds like it could be Chris Connor or someone singing in that style. Huge fan of the show, and thanks. Says. Robert, uh, who is also a cat dad, and he likes how we include ours in the show. Uh, I am the happy squire to our five feline knights. Okay, very good, Robert. Uh, I, I'm doing very badly today because I have not seen Squad Car, and I'm I'm a piker because uh, Robert here is comparing the voices of Vicky Raff and Chris Connor, and I couldn't tell those two apart on a dare. Uh, so, so I I have nothing for this because, uh, you know, like like everybody always writes to us and says, you know, I'm making a list of stuff I now have to watch. So, I guess Girl on the Bridge and Squad Car are immediately on my list of things I need to watch. Uh, does, does any of this ring a bell with you, Ann? Nope. <laughs> I'm telling you, we're, 
See, now, now they're into stump Eddie and Ann. Now that's what this has become. Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find something that they won't be able to answer, which may be very, very gratifying for the person sending in the question, but it makes us look really, really bad. I know. <laughs> so, that's okay. Because uh, I'm, I'm glancing ahead at question five, and I'm, I'm thrilled that I have an answer for this one. So. Okay, okay. and this question five is from Brian, uh, Westchester County, New York. Uh, what can you tell us about the 1948 movie Open Secret, directed by John Reinhardt and starring John Ireland and Jane Randolph, written by Henry Blankfort and Max Wilk from the story by Ted Merklin and Max Wilk? Is it an or you'd recommend? I have never seen it. Do you know if any prints still exist? By the way, it's... Its original musical score by Herschel Burke Gilbert was reused in many early 1950s film t TV series. Um, it's interesting that it always interests me when people know so much about a movie and then they've never seen it. So it's like I'm wondering like uh, where they go for their info. Uh, I just showed Open Secret. I just showed it in D.C. Uh, at the film festival and I showed it last uh last time out here as part of our uh, they tried to warn us series that was the theme and yeah open secret is it's really bottom of the barrel uh in terms of budget but reinhardt was always really good at making something out of nothing and the film uh is very much uh uh very provocative it it I showed it after Crossfire both times I've shown it. It's been like on a double bill with Crossfire because it's almost like uh, those of you who have seen Crossfire and those of you who haven't, I'm going to spoil something now, but um, Open Secret is like Monty's, Sergeant Montgomery's hometown, right? So the character that Robert Ryan plays in Crossfire, if you wondered where he came from before serving in the military, Open Secret is the answer. Uh, because it, it's a ve very much, uh, you know, about anti-Semitism and it takes place in a small town in the South. And uh, it, it, was, it was very, very interesting because, um, you know, it, it's an artifact. I'm not going to say it's a great film. You know, I like Reinhardt's. The other Reinhardt films that we've restored, like The Guilty and High Tide, I actually like them better than Open Secret, uh, which looks a little threadbare. But there's a lot of very dramatic and, and powerful stuff in it. And I don't want to spoil it by talking about the actual ending of Open Secret, if you haven't seen it. You should just watch the movie. But like when I showed it in D.C. the other day, it, it was one of the rare occasions where I told everybody in the intro to stay in their seats because I would come back and tell you what the original ending of the movie was, which for reasons I'm not yet entirely sure of, uh, the original ending got cut off. And it is extremely provocative and, and a very, very powerful ending that I think would have elevated the film to another level for a contemporary audience. But at the time, uh, whoever it was, the filmmakers or the distributors or somebody involved said the, the very, very end is a little too much a little too provocative we're going to cut it out and just move on so now that i've teased that horribly and i'm not going to say another word about it um people will just have to figure figure that out for themselves i'm sure some smart person's going to go on facebook and find the find a photograph of the actual last shot of the film and post it in the in the thread and say this was the actual last shot of the movie so okay um i know this is a, this is a weird episode so far i i like teased people mercilessly with that last one and i didn't have any answers for the previous two so <laughs> l 
Let's hope my batting average increases as we go along here. Okay, I okay. think it's your. It's my turn to uh, We're on six, right? Yes. Right. Okay. Um, and this is from Pete. Uh, sometime, some time ago, you mentioned you were thinking of updating your book, Dark City Dames, and releasing the new version. Is this something you're only thinking about, or will you do it in the near future? Here in Des Moines, uh, we we need all the copies of your books we can possibly get. Some of your books seem to be out of print. Could you please make a list of books titles so I could go look for them? And I am would be thought that this is something where I could actually put it up um, on our Facebook as a post, so people can can have that. And then also, Mark wanted to know if he had a complete set of all your commentaries. He likes an entire list of films, and that was the same thing. I was gonna. Uh, try and get a list of all your commentaries and we can put that up on Facebook as well. That's up. That, that It's not up on Facebook, but it's up on the, on the Noir city website or some, or not on the Noir. It's on my website. Sorry. It's on the okay. eddiemuller.com website. Okay. There, there is a list of, uh, I think we updated it because I haven't done an audio commentary since alias Nick Beal for Kino Lorber. That, that was the last one I did and probably will be the last one. But there's 30 some odd commentaries and there is a list on if you go to eddiemuller.com, it might take a little fidgeting around in there to find it, but um, it's in there somewhere. Great. I think it's in side bets or something has a list of of which is one of the menus or whatever that the you can go page. to on the website. Yeah. And um as for Dark City Dames, um, you know, I will say this. I, I'm very conscious of not putting Eddie Muller products up on the Film Noir Foundation site or the Noir City site or something because it's not an obvious overlap. I mean, yeah, Dark City Dames is a Film Noir book, but it really has nothing to do with you know, the Film Noir Foundation or the Noir City Festivals or anything like that. So I don't put lists of my books up, like Tab Hunter Confidential. Like, why would I list that on the website? You know, I, I don't, I, I don't, that's always been a conscious thing with me from the beginning is to like not use the nonprofit stuff we do for the foundation, you know, to just promote my books and, and such. But the, the answer to Pete's question is that, yes, Dark City Dames will be uh, published again, and it will either be through a regular publisher who wants to do it, and if they don't want to do it the way I would like to do it, then I'll just publish it myself, like through my Blackpool Productions uh, imprint. And when that will come out, I, it could be next year. It could be the year after, but it's definitely in the pipeline, which will make people happy who want to read it. And, they'll, it, you know, it should end up costing like 25 bucks and not the 250 bucks that the hardcover out of print version of that book now sells for online. So don't buy those. Sorry, book dealers, but, you know, they're making all the money. I don't get any, you know, 250 bucks. I don't get any of that. Yeah. But, and actually, you know, I found, I found it by accident. I was at half price books in Berkeley and I was going through the phone books and picked it up. And um, I had no idea you had written that book. I mean, I didn't know it existed. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> but it was like, it's great. It's it's a fantastic book, and I'm not just saying that because we work together. It's it's great. I think it's it's just has such an insight of uh, about uh, women in Hollywood. I mean, the stories these women tell about their life, sort of what when they were in the business and afterwards, and it's just really fascinating. Thank you, and I appreciate that Judith Regan, who published that book, didn't flinch when I said I want. I want the stories to be split in half. So the first half of the book is all about these actresses in Hollywood in their heyday competing very often for the same roles and what their lives were like. And then the second half of the book is not going to be a Hollywood book at all. It's just about what their lives were like when 
the Hollywood career was over. And needless to say, the second half of the book is every bit as interesting as the first half. In some in some cases, it's more interesting yeah. because you can't believe like how how wild the lives got. And then in other cases, of course, it's like maybe maybe the first half was the best half. I don't yeah. I don't know, you know. But it it thank you for saying that, Anne. And yeah, the the book will definitely come back into circulation sometime soon. So thank thank you, Pete. Uh, Joan wants to know if there's a decent black and white version of Man on the Eiffel Tower still available. Um, Man on the Eiffel Tower is a color film, is it not? <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm pretty certain that Man on the Eiffel Tower is a color movie. So I'm not entirely sure why you would want to watch it in black and white if it was made in color. I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm looking this up right now to see what the, uh, what the word is on this one, but um, you know, I'm terrible at using um, IMDB and stuff like that. I, I can't even, I'm so lame at this. I don't even know where I'm looking to find out if it's in color. So Again, more more failures on my part um, today. So I don't I don't even see the 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 credit here. So I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but of course, if you want it in black and white and you get it in color, just turn the color off on your monitor. That's what I always say. But. Um, so I don't actually know the answer to that one. I'm just failing miserably this week. Uh, well, let's see. A, a 1950 American Ansco color film. Yeah, it, that's what I thought. It, yeah. Burgess Meredith directed it. Charles Lawton is in it. Belita is in it. Uh, it's based on a George Simenon novel. And it was shot in color. So... You know, it raises an interesting point. Like if, if we were to restore that film, we would restore it in color, you know, because that was the intention of the filmmakers. Uh, if if all you've ever seen it in is black and white, um, then that was obviously on television. And uh, I'm not I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the what the story is with that and and what condition the surviving elements are in so subject for further research no doubt about that um okay who's who's reading I can the next this. question okay this one um david boardwell the acclaimed film academic discusses in detail in his book on films of the 1940s entitled reinventing hollywood that all of the narrative plots cinemagraphic etc techniques in film noir, uh, da, 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 were nothing new. They all appeared in 1930s or earlier films. Thus, Boardwell concluded that film noir is in a new 1940s genre style, further evident from the fact Boardwell knows that Hollywood never marketed these films as film noir. Simply put, put, one could say Boardwell is a film noir denier. Could you comment on Boardwell's position and explain why you believe film noir is indeed something special? reflecting the mood, culture, and history specific to the 1940s and 1950s. That's from Gordon. Our um, friend Gordon in New York. Uh, well, uh, all due respect, Gordon, I think you're, you may be misrepresenting uh, what David Bordwell is saying because none of those observations make him a film noir denier. He's just claiming that a lot of the things that people point out as being elements of film noir that began in the 1940s, he has, like the good academic he is, he has traced the examples of these things to earlier films, which you know is obviously the case because everybody who cites German Expressionism as an influence on film noir Obviously, those films were made 20, 25 years 
before what we think of as film noir. So I, I don't think what Bordwell is doing is denying it. He's saying that there are elements of this that happened earlier, which is very true. The thing that is that is undeniable is that film noir was a movement in Hollywood. And the evidence of that is that every single studio in Hollywood made at least 10 of these films every year from like 1943 to 1952. I would say every, every studio in Hollywood made at least 10 crime pictures shot in a certain way with a certain uh, visual look to them. And a great many of those had the villains as the protagonists, which was a completely new kind of thing in Hollywood. You did not find that. Uh, that was not as commonplace in Hollywood before that era. So it's just, there's a tricky thing when people want to talk about when did film noir start and all of that. It's one thing to say, well, you know, flashbacks didn't begin with double indemnity. And it's like, true enough. They were part of cinema in the silent era. Uh, but it wasn't, as, it just wasn't as common. So it's not like, you can always trace it back to one example, but it's completely wrong to say, um, you know, Ruben Mamoulian's City Lights in 1931 featured a flashback, ergo, Ruben Mamoulian invented the flashback that we know in film noir. I mean, that, that doesn't follow. What, what makes it a movement is that flashbacks are everywhere. They're in Out of the Past. They're in Double Indemnity. They're in The Locket. They're in Mildred Pierce. They're in The Lady from Shanghai. They're, uh, they're everywhere, uh, as are so many of the elements that we consider to be part and parcel of film noir. I mean, that, that's why it was a movement, because nobody was enforcing it. Nobody was telling people, you must do it this way. They were doing it that way of their own accord uh, in terms of the type of story they wanted to tell and in terms of uh, the motivations of the people involved, the way the story is structured, the way the story is photographed, all of that stuff. So to me, there is absolutely no question um, that this movement existed and and but I still don't see why you're extrapolating that Bordwell says it, it, that he's a film noir denier. Uh, he just thinks that a lot of those techniques existed earlier than than perhaps film noir fans give them credit for. So that's that's my take. Got any anything to add on that was <laughs> on that score? I mean, it's just yeah, it's yeah, just like a stuff and you know and also with the you know pointing out that you know the the films were marketed as film noir um that's just because that wasn't a term that was used you know they were just making crime pictures, and that was something that was discovered sort of by the french when they got this all these films coming in at the same time after the occupation and they, they were the ones that noticed all the similarities and, and kind of came up with that term. That's right. why it's in French. Of course. It makes me laugh to think of somebody telling one of the studio bosses, you know, this is film noir. And then, you know, ha what Harry Cohn or Daryl <laughs> Zanuck or somebody would have said about that. I mean, they were murder dramas and crime thrillers is, is what the preponderance of them were. Uh, anyway, I, I'm, I'm all but guaranteeing that somehow this is going to pop up again in one of the questions yet to come in this, in this episode. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm not seeing a name on this one, but, um, this My person, that's okay. This person, they'll know who they are. Uh, I've become a fan of Dennis O'Keefe after seeing films like Raw Deal, Cover Up, and T-Men, I'm curious as to why he's not often discussed among film noir greats like Mitchum, Robert Ryan, etc. 
seems like only us noiristas are very familiar with him. Well, that's true enough. Uh, he certainly had a good amount of noir on his resume alongside other genres. I thought he was great. Well, uh, we all think Dennis O'Keefe is great. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know what to say about that other than, you know, O'Keefe is part of that group uh, like Dick Powell and John Payne to a lesser degree, Dana Andrews, uh, actors who definitely started their careers is one thing. And because of this film noir movement, they became something entirely different. Like this is this. See, we had to wait only one question to see that, like more evidence of why there was a movement in Hollywood. Dennis O'Keefe's career, right? He's a lightweight comic. And then his agent, who was Eddie Small, the, the film producer, began as an agent. And actually, at one point in Hollywood, I think Dennis O'Keefe, a.k.a. Bud Flanagan, was his only client. And Eddie Small said, no, 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 we're making the switch to these other pictures. This is what's making money now. And he, he stuck O'Keefe in Raw Deal and in T-Men. Um, you know, uh, at Columbia, he did Walk a Crooked Mile. Uh, uh, he did, he's fabulous in Woman on the Run. Uh, you know, Cover Up was another one. There's a big feature story coming on Cover Up in the next issue of the Noir City Magazine. Uh, he was in Abandoned, made it universal where he's just terrific. He was so good with the quick, uh, wisecracking repartee that that was really his specialty. He was great at it. Yeah. And he, and he was kind of a thing. He was a, uh, you know, he had a TV show in the 1950s. He was a host on television and he was popular, but he was never an A-list actor at a major studio. So he's not going to get those Mitchum parts or those Widmark parts or the Dana Andrews roles or any of that, uh, that's just not going to happen. So he tends to be somewhat overlooked by mainstream people when they think about the great stars of that era, but he certainly had a good career. And, uh, you know, uh, a, a lot of those films survive and are just great. So, yeah, I'm a, I'm a big Dennis O'Keefe fan too. I, um, so, but I mean, that it, it really just has to do with, were you a big star at a big studio that had money to put behind you and money to keep the film circulating? Because so many of these movies we're talking about, like Cover Up and Raw Deal and T-Men and Woman on the Run, these were all independently made films. So just like we always say with the Film Noir Foundation, you don't know about these movies like Try and Get Me and Woman on the Run and Too Late for Tears and, um, you know, Cry Danger because they weren't made by major studios. So they slipped between the cracks. O'Keefe also at a certain point was wised up enough to say, you know, I want to make movies on my own. And while in the short term, that's a really cool thing and you can do what you want and, and go where you want, make your movies, uh, preserving them is a whole other thing because there is no gigantic studio to preserve it. So a lot of the movies that Dennis O'Keefe made, like Angela, which is a film that he actually wrote and directed, is really, really hard to find. It's, it's a difficult movie to see. So um, that, that's kind of what happens uh, to, to those stars who take that course it there there is a trap door that can open and in O'Keefe's case it it certainly did but thank goodness uh you know not all not all those movies have been lost yeah and I also just wanted since we're coming up on Halloween um I just want to recommend The Leopard Man oh yeah uh yeah. which was produced by the great Val Luton and is based on a Cornel Woolwich novel and I really love uh O'Keefe's performance in that film yeah, he's great. And and I always liked when Dennis O'Keefe was uh, I mean, he had he was very charming mm -hmm. and he had a great way with wisecracks. But when he turned serious, he, he could be a pretty scary, formidable figure on screen. 
So he was he was very versatile. And, uh, you know, he displays that so beautifully in Woman on the Run, Mm -hmm. where he's just, you know, he's the good guy until he's not the good guy any longer. And it's uh, it's very effective. Um, Okay, Um, Is it Uh, me? I think it's me. I I don't know. Uh, This doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's Howard from Silver Spring. Uh, What noise do you think make the best use of the CinemaScope widescreen process, either black and white or color? I I think early 20th century Fox CinemaScope noirs, such as House of Bamboo, made terrific use of the uh, widest possible screens. Uh, no, no argument there. House of Bamboo, if you can see the restored House of Bamboo on a big screen in a theater, it, it's pretty amazing. I mean, and the, the widescreen really like uh, ups, ups that film. Yeah. I mean, it's a good, it's a good movie, but Fuller's use of the widescreen and the color really makes it spectacular. And I know a lot of people argue that it might not be a film noir, but I love the the widescreen and Bad Day at Black Rock. No. I think it is really terrific. And a, a rarity that's really kind of fun is The Third Voice by Hubert it's Kornfield. It's a really good which, movie. Yeah, which is a black and white cinemascope film noir uh, late. Like, I think it's 60. I think it's 1960. Yeah with Edmund O'Brien in a great performance and Julie London, who everybody loves, right? Julie London and Lorraine Day is in it. And that that's a very clever script based on the Charles Williams novel. Uh, so the third voice is one that, man, I would love to show that. Uh, I, I have shown it at yeah. North City Festival. That's where I saw it. <laughs> yeah, but but it's a, it's a little tough these days to get your hands on that print. I'm not, you know... No. Uh, we're going to have to do some research on that. Um, but you know, it's, it's interesting because the look of those films is so distinctive that sometimes I just watched one recently on the criterion channel that I had never seen. I had never gotten around to seeing, uh, black widow with Van Heflin and, ah, um, uh, Gene Tierney is in it. And, you know, uh, and it was, it was worth it just to look at it mm-hmm. because the the color was so spectacular and the widescreen is so fabulous in terms of the compositions of those interiors and all that stuff. And I, that I little really... bitch got what she deserved. <laughs> oh yeah. 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 Oh good. I'm glad. But, but like, here's one where it really is like noir or not. Cause uh, yeah. that, re- that really plays like a fifties melodrama. That, does. that does not, that does not, play like film noir to me and i know that fox originally put it out as part of its film noir series Mm -hmm. on dvd back in the back in those old days in the early part of this century uh but i don't really think of it as a as a film noir but it's a really it's a really interesting script and i mean a good uh premise and of course it was timely once again because it's kind of a it's kind of a me too kind of a thing where the guy gets accused of having an affair with this woman. And it seems like he's going to be defenseless because everything is stacked against him. But um, anyway, I don't want to spoil the plot. Yeah, Uh, Yeah, But I do think um, George Raft though does kind of bring it into a a noir feeling like that was, it's like casting him as the detective sort of pulls it a little back more into the nor territory i think than if they had a different actor playing that role uh true enough it was good good to see him in that film uh, yeah. you know <laughs> that's why i have a copy <laughs> oh okay very good very good uh all right now uh here we go i we cannot do an installment without this question being asked <laughs> here we go it's, again. <laughs> it's like impossible so edward and i it wasn't me wasn't me who did this Edward asks, repeat along with me, class. Edward <laughs> asks, are there noir westerns? This has probably been asked, uh, but it occurred to me after watching Pursued, uh, Robert Mitchum Western with many noir elements, 
Uh, it also deals with the problem of returning vets, although the war here is the Spanish-American War. The hero seems to be doomed to an inexorable and terrible fate. Uh, you know, I also don't, and, and Edward is making some comments here, like saying Teresa Wright also has some noir chops. Indeed, she has appeared in film noir, but that doesn't make it a noir just because an actor's in it who has done noir films, right? I mean, actors at that time, I know for a fact, they did not care what they were doing. They just wanted to work. And when they were typecast, like Richard Widmark was typecast, they just wanted out that like, I, I don't, I want to stop making these movies. Uh, and, and of course, Edward points out that the Anthony Mann Westerns have many noir elements. Um, anyway, uh, again, this is going back to the question that uh, Gordon asked about, you know, David Bordwell claims there wasn't a noir movement, but there had to be because there are so many noir Westerns. There are so many Westerns that look like film noir, like Ramrod and Pursued and Stations West and are not, uh, is it Stations West? Yeah. Yeah. Stations West. Uh, uh, it, uh, some of those man films certainly uh, have noirish qualities to them uh blood on the moon obviously so yeah there was a thing with the way films looked that definitely uh you you could easily program a noir western that which criterion did the criterion channel did a whole thing of noir westerns and so yeah it's it's a real thing rawhide is all i mean you know, rawhide is the petrified forest done as a Western, right? Yeah. Uh, and, you know, is so once again, is it the storyline that's making it noir? Because the petrified forest, nobody called that noir when that story came out. But there are dozens of other ones, right? Uh, the Dark Past was made in 1939 and people didn't really call that movie, which was Blind Alley, they didn't really call it a film noir. But then in 1949, when the movement was in full swing, the remake, The Dark Past, was definitely considered to be a film noir. Uh, and, uh, you know, you just see this. There are war movies that are definitely noir, you know, all the way up into the 60s. Like Don Siegel's Hell is for Heroes is, is very much a noir war movie uh anyway so yes edward i would say there there is such a thing as a noir western not all westerns are noir but it, it has to do with uh if you take a single completely obsessed character and shoot it in such a way that it feels like a noir then it's a noir western and this one is uh, from our friend craig from carlsbad I recently watched one of my favorite film noir crime thrillers, The Breaking Point, with John Garfield and the wonderful and underappreciated Phyllis Baxter. I've only seen her in a couple of very good dark movies, Blood on the Moon and, <laughs> and Act of Violence. Blood on the Moon. There you but go. her acting in Garfield's, as Garfield's playing, in quotation mark, plain looking, a wife was just superb. My question for you, Eddie, is why do you think Baxter didn't get many movie roles in which to demonstrate her very ample talent? Was she more of a stage actress most of her career? I know she was in several Alfred Hitchcock hour TV shows. I think it's a shame she got she got so good few parts after after the late 40s. Please let me know your opinion. For my money, I believe that Phyllis Thaxter and Audrey Totter were two of the best actresses in Hollywood and both got only a few opportunities to show their talent. Didn't um didn't Phyllis Thaxter play wasn't she Superman's mom? I think she was Superman's mom in the in the original okay. with with not not in the old days. I mean, in the in the Christopher Reeve Superman. Oh, OK, good. He's going to say with a TV show with it. Oh, my God. Was that her? It was Glenn. Glenn Ford and Phyllis Saxon played oh my God. played Superman's parents in uh, in the 78 version of the film. Uh, why? Um she is didn't have that long a career 
uh, I don't know exactly, but I know that it, it's funny that, um, uh, okay, I'm looking under, uh, I'm looking, I'm cheating and going on IMDb to see, because my thought about her was that um, uh, she probably got married, which was the case with a number of actresses, you know, who in their 20s and 30s were good. And then they got older and then it's like they married and, didn't, you know, if they, if they did, if they married well, they didn't pursue the career as much. I'm sure she did a lot of television. I'm sure Phyllis Thaxter did a lot of TV stuff. Um, but it's funny that uh, that he mentioned Audrey Totter because uh, I know there's a movie from the 40s called Bewitched by Arch Obler where Phyllis Thaxter plays a schizophrenic woman and the voice in her head, the evil voice in her head is played by Audrey Totter. Awesome. So, so I yes, need to you get see a, that. I like our you, you get a, anyway, obviously yeah, I'm a radio you, person. Yeah. You, you get a twofer there. You get Phyllis Thaxter and Audrey Totter playing two sides of the same character, but you won't, you only hear Audrey Totter. And it's funny you say that about the radio thing, because Audrey told me that that was, she said it was great because it was like back in my radio days. Audrey did a lot of radio in the late 30s and early 40s. Audrey Totter did a lot of radio because she could do voices and dialects and things. So she was very much in demand. OK, I'm, I'm going to have to go down a rabbit hole of finding her old time radio performances now. Oh, They're yeah. She was like uh, she was like um, Ted DeCorsia, who did the same thing. He played a, a, Ted DeCorsi is sometimes there'd be like 10 rolls in a t nice, nice stretch with the cat paw there in the side of the frame. I love that. <laughs> that was good. She's showing off her uh, gams. Yeah. But DeCorsi, if there were 10 rolls in it, he'd play nine of them. Yeah. And he'd, and he'd just change his voice and, and do different bits. And yeah, because probably and they people were all, don't. No, I'm just going to say, and they were all like different ethnicities. No, because I was going to say, pro people don't probably realize that they don't know about old time radio but there were actors that would play multiple parts in in one episode oh yeah uh, i forgot what the term's called but and uh and there was like an episode of jack benny where um mel blank i counted it out and he did eight different voices in the same episode it do doesn't surprise me at all and it's interesting because i'm not trying to be provocative by saying this but it is kind of funny because you know, with uh, the um, concern today about casting, you know, you cast people, you know, like you, you don't cast a Caucasian as Charlie Chan or, you know, Mr. Moto or something. Uh, it's very interesting because on radio, you couldn't tell. Yeah. Right. And so, I mean, I'm sure, uh, uh, I'm sure a Chinese person would be able to tell that it was not, that the actor playing Chinese was not Chinese, but it, but it just wasn't that big an issue back then because the producers were like, if we can get one person that can play eight roles, we're going to save a lot of money. Yeah. And I mean, that, that was the key. They're going to save a lot of time and money. So that, that was a talent that was greatly appreciated in old time radio. Anyway, uh, the question was about Phyllis Thaxter. Uh, she is great in The Breaking Point. She is fantastic in The Breaking Point, heartbreaking even. And she's also very good. She only has the one scene in No Man of Her Own uh, with Barbara Stanwyck. But, you know, it's crucial to the, to the whole plot of the film. And she's terrific. Yeah. You know, so if you, if you haven't seen that, uh, she is really good in it. And that was like one of those early examples of, because she made that the same year she did The Breaking Point. Uh, but spoiler alert, um, she's not in uh, No Man of Her Own very long. No, she's and not. So, and so, and, but that was kind of cool because they cast her because she was kind of a known actress at that point. And so when she came on the screen, people very much let their guard down.
Yeah. You know, and said, oh, she's in this movie too, you know. And then, of course, the incident happens that sets the whole plot in motion. And uh, that, that was quite a shocker for audiences at that time. Well, and also, I mean, she's just so very kind. And it's just, it really, I mean, it's, it is, it's just really kind of one scene, but like, I remember her in that because the character, she just imbued her with such a, like, just a really kind feeling where you really liked this person, even though you're only really seeing her in one scene. Yeah, she's very effective. And, and I don't think there's any scene, I don't think there's any scene in film noir, there's several that really get me every time and kind of choke me up because of the very human emotion of the, of the scene. And I will say there are several of those in the breaking point, but the one where she comes home and takes the scarf off and reveals that she's bleached her hair yeah. so that her husband will like her more is phenomenal. And the way her little girls, what did you do, mommy? It's absolutely outrageous, you know, and, all, and she just starts to tear up and it's like, it gets you every time. It just cuts your heart out, you know, and, uh, and, and Garfield is great. You know, the way he, I like it. Yeah. It's going to take me a little getting used to, you know, it, that's, I love that movie. That movie is so great. And, you know, Garfield, one last little bit about Phyllis Thaxter. Uh, Garfield told Michael Curtiz in the his last scene in that movie, uh, where they rescue him from the from the boat, and they're going to uh, amputate his arm. Um, Garfield told Michael Curtiz, "Just leave the camera on Phyllis Thaxter. Right? I've been in this whole movie. You don't need me. This is about yeah. her." And it is fascinating because there is no reverse angle shot that you're kind of expecting yeah. of the star of the movie. It's her. Yeah. I mean, that whole last scene is her. He has no close up or anything, and which is stunning for, for a movie star of Garfield's caliber to like give up the, the climactic scene of the movie to another actor. Yeah. That was really something. Anyway, love that film. Now I got to go watch some more Phyllis Daxter now. I know. And I had to find out your toddler radio shows. There you go. <laughs> uh, okay, Bob, Bob, Bob asks, uh, what's the first noir film to feature a TV set? And I'm looking at this and I'm trying to figure out if he means shot on a TV set or if he means that features a TV set. I think he means features a TV like set. The, like the with the knobs that you know like the, knobs, the you know. volume and channel uh knobs um that's a good question i'm not i'm not entirely sure i know the answer to that because i was going to say the first film that you could maybe call noir that was about tv um was the glass web which was a 3D movie made by Universal with our friend Kathleen Hughes and uh, Edward G. Robinson that is set at a TV station, you know, uh, and, and so TV figures prominently in it. Um, I don't know if it's the first, but the one that makes the biggest impression to me is Try and Get Me, uh, where... The, Frank Lovejoy's son and wife go over to the neighbor's house to watch TV because they live in such a poor little community that only one house has a TV. Yeah. And so all the families crowd into the neighbor's house to, to watch television. And he has to go. And when he finally gets a job and he brings the groceries home, he goes and gets them to bring them home and the kid doesn't want to leave because they're watching some cowboy picture on TV or something. And I just remember that the way that scene was shot and photographed, it, it really was treating television like this magic show that was going to change everything in the culture, which was absolutely true. Uh, so I remember that one. And I remember 
um, dial dial one 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 nine about the uh, the the guy who holds everybody hostage in a bar. Marshall Thompson holds everybody hostage, and there's TV sets playing in the bar. So, you know, this is what I hate about bars, contemporary bars, is that there's all these big flat screen TVs everywhere yeah. in the bar. And it's just like makes you crazy because you want to go into a bar and have a nice, quiet bar and talk to people. And it's like sports 24 seven in the bars. Right. But amazingly, in this 1950 movie from MGM, there were the, they hoisted big TV sets, you know, the cubes up into the corner of the bars and they were playing in there. And I, I think most of the movies that feature TV sets are in the fifties. Mm-hmm. Like I'm starting to think of them now, like obviously uh, 99 river street, John Payne is watching himself lose the title fight on television at the yeah. start of the movie, He's watching a replay. You're watching great fights of the past on, you yeah. know, the, and uh, so, so that was another one. It wasn't all that common for movie studios to want to show televisions mm-hmm. in these films because TV was the enemy mm-hmm. and, you know, stealing box office away. So I'm sure there was a lot of discussion when they wanted to show a TV. Like, do we really want to do this? I mean, wh- why? Why are we yeah. doing this? You know? um, those, those are the examples I can think of uh, off the top of my head. I, Bob, I have to confess, I don't know the answer as to which was the first movie, you know, or the first, in this qu- case, it's which was the first film noir to feature a television set. But th- those are a few that I can think of. And uh, this is from, no, you're doing this one. You're doing 14. I am? Yeah. Okay. No, uh, I'm supposed to do it. <laughs> I forgot what we were doing. Sorry. Okay, go right it. Go right ahead, Ann. You're uh, up. This is from uh, Richard uh, from the Sea Ranch, California. Several years ago, a blog entitled "Mysterious Matters," which is designed to educate and entertain both writers and readers of mystery and suspense novels, asked, "Who is the world's best mystery writer?" The somewhat unexpected answer was Mar- uh, Margaret Millar. Are you familiar with the work? Her better known husband, Ross McDonald, was also a notable contributor to the genre. Yes, I I was. Yes, I am aware of Margaret Miller. And I. I wish I could tell you I'm drawing a blank on what her maiden name was, but she married Kenneth Miller, which is Ross McDonald's real name. And. Yeah, she uh, she won several Best Mystery Novel awards from the Mystery Writers of America. I know, uh, I think her most famous book is probably Beast in View, which uh, was way out of its time. And, you know, written right about the time that Dorothy Hughes wrote In a Lonely Place. And, you know, there were a lot of really, really great female uh, genre writers, you know, that didn't necessarily write mysteries like Dorothy Hughes, I guess, was a mystery writer. Charlotte Armstrong, uh, obviously Patricia Highsmith, uh, you know, Margaret Miller, uh, perhaps not. She's not as well known because I don't think as many of her books were turned into movies. Certainly not as many as uh, Dorothy Hughes or Patricia Highsmith or even Charlotte Armstrong, for that matter. Um but yes, uh, it is kind of interesting that she's not as well known or the fact that for as well known as Ross McDonald is, and it surprises me that he's not more well known to a, to a modern audience, that people don't realize that 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 was like a husband and wife team, yeah. you know? And and I'm not saying that she wrote his books, but they both wrote crime fiction. Like uh, Marsha Muller and Bill Pronzini are married. They live up here in Northern California. They still write crime fiction, you know. Um, so yeah, I don't know that I, I haven't read enough of her books to say that she's the greatest 
mystery writer of them all. Uh, I certainly, that that is surprising. Let's just put it that way. That is a surprising thing. I don't know what year that would have been. Uh, you know, it has everything to do with keeping your books in print. Yeah. And I, and I just see that McDonald's books have sort of come back into print. Yeah. It's very interesting. You know, there was a time at which Ross McDonald was the most famous mystery writer in America. There, you know, I, I lived through through that period. Yeah. And yet today, I don't I don't think he's really that well known. And you know, he he outwrote Hammett and Chandler and those guys like 10 to 1. Uh, and the quality of them, especially in the 1960s, was really great. So Margaret Miller, it's funny, I guess she she became kind of overshadowed yeah. uh, by her husband. And anyway, um, it might be time to go back and review some of her other work. I know I, I know I, I've read more than Beast and View, but quite honestly, I, I cannot remember. Um, I have, I have them here somewhere. So, um, okay. That's that. Now, now it's my turn. Um, okay. This is Don and Don says, uh, while I thoroughly enjoyed your discussion with Anne on women in noir films, I, I think we've had that discussion a few times. I didn't yeah. know it was just yeah. one. Uh, especially your definition of what makes a femme fatale. I thought you left out several actresses worth mentioning. Oh, okay. Here, here we go. Don's in. <laughs> that is straight now. Uh, yes. Joan Bennett in Scarlet Street and Woman Absolutely. in the Window. You bet. Jane Greer in Out of the Past. Uh, come on. Top three. Uh, and Gene Simmons in Angel Face. Uh, I consider her top five femme fatale in, in film noir. Uh, all three fit the role of the fatal uh, fatal women with agendas who get men to willingly do things against their better judgment. Um, Don, you might be surprised to know that Angel Face is not necessarily a lesser known noir story. Uh, it's pretty pretty well known because it's a Mitchum film, right? right? It. If it was somebody other than that, then yeah, the fact that Gene Simmons is playing a femme fatale is sort of like not common. Yeah. But the fact that Mitchum is the sucker uh, makes it part of his whole body of work being a fool uh, in, in film noir. And of course, he includes uh, Body Heat. Uh, uh, is this movie considered neo-noir? Uh, body heat Don is considered perhaps the ultimate neo-noir. I mean, it, it is so, so obviously a rethinking of double indemnity that it, uh, yes, it is completely a neo-noir, but like I said, when I showed that on TCM with Ben Mankiewicz, I said, it's so, it's so interesting that that movie is now 40 Two years old. <laughs> Body Heat was made 42 years ago, right? So that's the difference between more time has passed between Body Heat being released and today than passed between Double Indemnity and Body Heat. <laughs> Mainly, but, you're you just know, feeling really old. That's kind of I, that's really the part I'm stuck on right now. Is I'm feeling. I know old. it. It it's a it's a weird thing to comprehend. But but I I bring that up because at a certain point it's like when does when does it stop being neo noir, and it's just more noir. Yeah. Right. Because when when we showed Body Heat, I said, if not for the fact that there's nudity in this film yeah. and there's some bad language in this film. There's nothing else that separates it from double indemnity. I mean, it's in color granted it's in color, but so what, like I always say to people, if you want to know what that would be like as a, you know, noir film, just turn off the color on your TV set and, and watch the damn thing. 
but it feels a oh, nice cat butt. Yeah, there you go. Gee whiz. What's this cat's name again? T Tierney? <laughs> Lawrence Tierney? Tierney. That was... T what? No, say his name again. Tyrion. T Y R. -I -R. <laughs> that's way too complicated. But I I'm telling you, any cat that sticks its butt right in the camera, I'm I'm changing the name to Tierney. That's that's Lawrence Tierney cat. Yeah, perfect. And this other guy is just staring at him like, why is he getting the hugs? This is not okay. There's going to be more scratching in your future, Anne. I can tell the way th these cats are setting you up now. <laughs> I know. You're going to get the scratchiness. Um, but that's just a that time passes, you know. So in 1970 and 1980, it made sense to call things neo noir because it's like it all felt relatively new, but now, you know, 40 years have passed. I mean, for God's sakes. And like with Chinatown, we, we will soon be celebrating the 50th anniversary of, of Chinatown. And what are you going to do? You know, I mean, time, time marches on and I just don't know at a certain point how these labels really apply. I mean, Chinatown is a detective story. Mm -hmm. Above all else, it's a detective story based on historical fact. But I tend to think of it as a noir film because its worldview is so incredibly dark and pessimistic. Um, anyway, that's... Uh, and Don also adds a shout out to Anne saying, I too like having the actual movie in my possession rather than a virtual one stored on a streaming service website. You just have to have a dedicated space to display and store them. Well, there you go. We're seeing your display space right over your shoulder there, Anne. So yeah. one of them. And that, that's, yeah. Yeah. But that hallway, my foyer is, uh, I have several, a couple shelves for DVDs in Blu-rays. Yeah. Well, I think people can see this is, you know, I'm in my office where it's mostly books. Uh, a lot of Blu-rays and DVDs are through that doorway behind me. And then there are three storage units <laughs> separate from the house that has books and, and uh, more DVDs and all kinds of ephemera and stuff. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of it. Okay. So we're, we're at the last one. We're at the last one, and are we really? That went by uh, fast. Uh, that's because I didn't have answers for a number of them. That's why it went faster. When you say, "Nope, never seen that movie." <laughs> nope, don't know about Squad Card. Nope, nope, I don't know about a black and the white black and white man on the Eiffel Tower. Nope, don't know that. So th you're going to strangle this cat <laughs> with your hair. Look at this guy. This is like showbiz. Is it, this is this is starting to look a little bit like a has elements of like a Japanese horror movie all of a sudden. <laughs> like he's he's got the it's like Ringu or something on this cat's face. So yeah. yes, Brennan has a long. He's pretty cute with though. Black cats. So I, I was not surprised that he got another black cat. Yeah. So so did I. My first two cats were black cats, and there's now a feral black cat living in down below my house. I mean, it helps that I feed him. I mean, you know, but uh, <laughs> he's pretty cool. He's pretty cool. You didn't just suddenly uh, stick around for no reason? Uh, he's sticking around now, that's for sure. But he, he won't let any humans get near him. So I know that he's smart. And uh, he just takes the food and hangs out and then leaves. And he's good. So uh, anyway, you, you want me to read the last one or you want to read it? Uh, I can read it. Uh, this okay. is from Johnny, a good film noir name. Johnny from Johnny. Uh, Dorsten, Pennsylvania. Is Dor is Out of the Dorsten. Past the champion for most cigarettes smoked in a film noir? Any other contenders? It's also amazing to see the huge amount, the huge number of cigarettes ads in magazines with famous actor endorsements back then. 
Mitchum would have seemed an obvious pitch man, but apparently not. I guess he smoked the wrong brand, if you know, if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. Um, Interesting. I'm 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 surprised that Chris Mitchum, uh, Robert Mitchum's son, when I met him, he asked me if I if I thought it was a good idea if he tried to market Robert Mitchum rolling papers. <laughs> and I and I said like that's that's so perfect, but that was a few years ago, and it's like you better get on this now if you want to do this because number one, I mean, nobody's going to buy rolling papers at a certain point because, you know, the more all this gets legalized, the more people are just going to buy their cannabis like pre-rolled and stuff like that. And so, uh, you know, you, you may have missed your oper window of opportunity there, Chris. All the kids but, vape. Um, yeah, you know, they all vape and all that stuff. So the, the Mitchum rolling papers was a great idea at one time. Uh, and I'm not going to argue that out of the past probably has the most cigarettes in it of any, of any movie noir or not. I mean, it's just every time there's some kind of dramatic, something dramatic happens in the film, everybody pulls out a cigarette. That's like their reaction to everything. But I do think that uh, double indemnity has a lot of smoking in it because all the, all the principal smoke, including, Edward G. Robinson with his cigars and the whole lighting of the cigarettes and cigars between the two guys is huge. Yeah. And Stanwyck has a few great cigarette lighting scenes. And, you know, that that one where she flames the match and it's that beautiful profile shot of her. Uh, so there's a lot of those, uh, you know, any Bogart film. God damn, it's what ended up killing him. Right. So yeah. any. Any Bogart film, he is smoking like a chimney in those. But it, it, yeah, out of the past is the one. And mainly it's because of the scene where Mitchum uh, has the fight with Steve Brody and then Jane Greer shoots Steve Brody and Mitchum's reaction to the whole thing is just like to pull out a cigarette and light it up, you know, and what what else are you going to do? So, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's uh that that's a pretty good one. And yeah. I remember when I was making when I made my short film when I was in school, um I, I made a like a 20 minute homage to Raymond Chandler detective stories called Bay City Blues. And I remember uh all the fun how fun it was picking locations that because I made this in like the late, late seventies, like 78 or 79 and finding locations that looked like the forties in San Francisco and then learning like how you had to avoid signage and all this kind of stuff. Um, and so many of those things are all part of an era. Like it was funny. We'd find a perfect location and then there'd be like a sign for a bomb shelter yeah. on the wall. And it's like, how interesting like that that's 10 years late too late right that was a 50s sign put up and we had a 40s location and it's like can't can't have the bomb shelter sign that wasn't a thing yet but i remember these people who worked with me old, much older people who who like had the locations either they were the landlords or they were the office managers or something and I'd go in there and they'd say, oh, so you're shooting a film set in the 40s. They say, well, you're getting it all wrong because there's not enough smoke. <laughs> yeah, everybody smoked. Everybody smoked yeah. all the time. It's like there should be, you know, and I'd set up a scene and they'd be like, there should be like two cigarettes burning in the ashtray because, you know, otherwise it doesn't look right. And it was, <laughs> so it was just constant. As you know, Ann, you're a smoker. I am. Are you still, are you still smoking? I am still smoking. Kaiser would okay. like me to stop. <laughs> this, this is more, look at it. He's just, now he's got a wig on. He just did a whole thing where your hair flipped over his top of his head. And it looked like he was wearing like a Beatles wig or something. Uh, this is the most affection ever displayed on Ask Eddie and Ann. 
Yeah. So this, this, this guy is. Oh, and here comes the other one now. Jeez, Louise. I just feel totally left out. You know, I just, I have no kitty. Oh, man. Look at that guy. Yeah. I mean, Brendan always gets the most affectionate cats. It's amazing. That's good. Me. They're always such cuddlers. Um, I just want to tell a quick story because we we're talking about uh, double indemnity. You know, you know how, um, and Bogart does it, Maltese Falcon as well, where they light the match by clicking their thumbnail on it. Yes. So my dad, you know, uh, grew up in that in that era, you know, when he was when he was younger. You know, he was born in 1933. And he talked about like, you know, like when he, when he first started smoking, like in high school and stuff, like trying to do that. And like, it really hurts like a son of a bitch. <laughs> It'll, you know if the, it flames up under your thumbnail it, it or it'll dig in when you're yeah. trying to do it and the head gets gets in there so just so now when i see somebody do that i always think about my dad <laughs> just talking you know just picturing my dad as a young man trying to do that and it, i think the secret is you have to you have to have your thumbnail a certain length yeah and then you have to have strike anywhere matches yeah, I mean that's that's the crucial thing is that that you can, they'll just strike on anything, you know. Yeah, well, those were the but, back of my dad's day. That is what they had. In fact, when I was yeah. in London, because I smoked in London as well, and Swan matches, and you could like you could just strike them against like a, a glass, like a window, and it would light yeah. up. Yeah. Well, my fa- my favorite in movies is when the guys light them off their rear end. Like like they just like reach down and like strike it off the off their sure. backside, you know, yeah. and it's like, how, how does that work? You know, <laughs> it's like, like, I'm sure they have a little, you know, piece of sandpaper or something stuck there for the effect, you know, so yeah. that they can do that. But uh, I've tried it. It doesn't work. It doesn't <laughs> work. To like a match off your butt. It doesn't, doesn't actually work. <laughs> um, and I had strike anywhere matches because I, I have a whole drawer full of them. Just because I like to pull them out and light a match wherever I feel like it. Yeah, it's fun. I'll probably actually. burn my house down someday, you know. <laughs> anyway, well, Anne, I think we've uh, gone through all these questions. I know yes. that people uh, people are disappointed when we don't get around to their questions, but you can see how much time we eat up uh, doing each one. It's astounding that each one of these episodes ends up coming out to kind of the same time, no matter what we do. Yeah, I know. No, it's no just... matter like how many questions I whiff on or how how long I talk on one particular thing, it always ends up coming out to around the same amount of time. And I just uh, want to which... okay. No, well, I just want to let people know. So uh, we did uh, we these questions uh, are through July thirty first <laughs> when they were emailed. I know. In. We... So just so people know. Uh, if your question was submitted after July 31st, we haven't gotten into it yet. That we are doing our best because we're doing every two weeks now, which is helping. Um, yeah. But sometimes, too, I have, like, less questions if I know. Like, last week, the question someone asked about doing the commentaries with Mr. Elroy, and I knew, well, that's going to be, like, forever. <laughs> okay. Well, I personally, no, I mean, no personal offense to anyone. Because I thank everyone for listening, and I, I love the fact that people enjoy the show. But I'm going to uh, declare a moratorium on on the noir western. Okay. Because we 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 are in agreement that like yes, there is such a thing as a noir western. Uh, I wouldn't go too far out of the classic era looking for them, right? Yes. Uh, because the genuine noir Western, as this gentleman indicated, is it, are things like Pursued and Blood on the Moon and stuff like that, uh, that really look like, you know, uh, John Ford's My Darling Clementine. You could call that a noir Western because it, it's, yeah. it's certainly photographed like it's a film noir, you know. Uh, and that, to me is just more evidence of of what this movement was in Hollywood, because I guarantee you that Ford would have shot my darling Clementine differently 
1939 or in 1957. That would have the film would have looked different. Mm -hmm. But because he made it in what 47 or 48, I mean, right at the at the high tide of noir, um, it it looks just like a film noir. So that's that's the scoop. And uh, yeah. I guess the next time we can do one of these again fairly soon because my travel is uh, limited until the middle of November when I go on the right. TCM cruise. And uh, and then I'll have all sorts of fun things to report after that. But I think we'll get another we'll get at least one more of these in before uh, before I go on the cruise. Maybe two. Who knows? Maybe yeah. two. We should be able to. Yeah, hopefully then we will. Like I said, I'll we'll try and work things out so we can keep on our every two week schedule so people know when we're doing this. And um, just let people know there's also um, I do do shorts now for Mask Eddie episodes. So we I just released one on Audrey Totter that has been very popular. Um, I have one on Norwesterns as well. And um, so those are up on our uh, YouTube channel, North City SF. So that um, things that I think we have, and I'm going to do one, and we had a really good discussion on Jim Thompson, who comes up a lot. So I'll be doing a short on that one, Great. Uh, hopefully Great. next week after this broadcast, then you guys can watch that because that discussion on Jim Thompson was really good. Good. So that that's perfect because then maybe people can see those and it'll maybe answer the question. Yeah. You know, uh, and and we can get to some other stuff in here. So it's good. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, okay. okay. Everybody, I thank everybody for the questions. It was fantastic. And I thank uh, all those great folks in DC for coming out to the film festival. It was a uh, really, really great fun. Um, I had a very uh, emotional experience introducing a place in the sun with George Stevens jr uh that was that was really great uh because you know he's a very significant figure in the history of pre uh, in preserving american film history mm -hmm. i mean george stevens junior is like a major major player in that regard right he he created the american film institute he he uh you know, convinced uh, President Kennedy to create the National Endowment for the Arts, which was vitally important. Uh, you know, he has been in film preservation and restoration. That was like one of the initial things the AFI did. And it's time he's done so many great documentary films about Hollywood history. Uh, you know, he started the Kennedy Center Honors uh thing that was him he did the afi tributes which were some of the first things i remember seeing on television as a kid in the early 70s that really piqued my interest in classic film you know he did a, a tribute to john ford a tribute to orson welles oh, yeah. there was one yeah. there was one for jimmy cagney there was one for barbara stanwick and and he he just did all that stuff on his own impetus and it's just uh really paved the way for everything that everybody else has done subsequently. So it was really a treat to be able to introduce his dad's or arguably his dad's masterpiece uh, with him at the, at Silver Spring. That was really great. That's awesome. He, yeah, it, it was good stuff. Wow. So anyway, and we'll be back. We'll be yes. back sooner. You won't even have time to miss us and we'll be back. <laughs> And that's right. Okay. Good night, all. Thank you. And hopefully we will see you in two weeks.